time become death, the destroyer of worlds. Humanity is often defined by its technological advancements. The use of tools and the development of science, engineering and our understanding of the world has resulted in humans becoming the dominant species on the planet. But for every innovation designed to improve life, there are plenty more designed to take life away. No such technological marvel and horror encompasses this better than nuclear weapons. In today's video, we will be covering just what nuclear weapons are, how the first nuclear weapons were developed, and their brief history in shaping the world. Nuclear weapons are an umbrella term for bombs that rely on creating a nuclear reaction to produce an explosion. When it comes to these devastating weapons, there are generally two types of nuclear reactions that are used, fission and fusion. Fission occurs when certain atoms are bombarded with neutrons. These atoms absorb the neutrons, resulting in the atoms splitting apart. This process was first discovered by German and Austrian scientists Otto Hahn, Fritz Strassmann and Lisa Meitner. If these reactions release further neutrons, these can then go on to react with other atoms, resulting in a chain reaction with huge amounts of energy being released. The scientist to first create a fission chain reaction was Hungarian physicist Leo Szilard. The very first nuclear bomb used relied on this type of nuclear fission. The key material used for this reaction was uranium, notably an isotope called uranium-235. When uranium-235 undergoes nuclear fission, it releases more neutrons than are required to cause the reaction, as many as three neutrons. This high number of neutrons being released means there was a greater chance in more atoms of uranium splitting, with the process repeating in ever greater instances. Uranium-235 was used in the making of the Little Boy Bomb. The Little Boy Bomb was developed as part of the Manhattan Project, the United States Nuclear Weapons Program. During the 1930s, scientists such as Enrico Fermi, Leo Szilard and Otto Hahn were exploring the possibility of nuclear weapons. Leo Szilard was fearful that Nazi Germany could be the first to develop such a devastating weapon, and with the help of Albert Einstein, petitioned the United States government to commence their own undertakings. Many scientists who had fled Nazi-occupied Europe ended up working in the United States to ensure that such weapons would be produced before Hitler would have access to such a weapon. Whilst the Allies could never know just how far the German nuclear program had progressed, there was thankfully little that had been achieved. Many of the minds that could have helped fled Nazi oppression, including the Jewish scientist Lise Meitner, otherwise known as the mother of the atomic bomb. She had already fled to Sweden when she correctly interpreted Hahn's findings on nuclear fission due to Nazi oppression. But as the Americans could not know just how far the program may have progressed, time was very much of the essence. The Manhattan Project was launched in August of 1942, with tens of thousands involved in the production of the first atomic bombs. Headed by Julius Robert Oppenheimer, the project brought together some of the greatest scientific and engineering minds. The result was four nuclear bombs. Little Boy would rely on a nuclear fission reaction using uranium-235. The design was that of a gun barrel, where within the bomb, the uranium would be fired into one another and trigger the chain reaction. The Little Boy bomb design was never tested, as it was believed to be such sound science it was seen as unnecessary. In addition, obtaining uranium-235 was incredibly labour and financially intensive, as the particular isotope only makes up around 0.7% of the uranium that naturally exists. It then had to be separated or enriched from more abundant uranium isotopes, a hugely difficult process. Because of this, a second type of bomb was therefore developed, which would be named Fat Man. This bomb would use an implosion type device with a different fissile material, plutonium. The Fat Man used conventional explosives around a central mass of plutonium. This mass would then be subjected to immense pressure and increasing density of the plutonium. This would in turn allow the plutonium to reach its critical mass and trigger the fission chain reaction. 
Whilst both bombs used different methods of controlling and triggering a reaction, both used nuclear fission to create the explosion. As for the power of each of these bombs, it represented a major shift in man's capacity for destruction. The little boy bomb delivered a blast yield of around 15 kilotons, whilst the fat man delivered around 21 kilotons. One kiloton is equivalent of 1,000 tons of TNT. Thankfully to date, little boy and fat man are the only such weapons deployed against humans. We do have a full video on this topic which will be linked in the description and pinned in the comments. The two bombs were used against Imperial Japan. It is thought that as many as 200,000 people were killed at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Then the effects of radiation for those exposed to the fallout from the weapons are thought to have led to horrendous medical complications, namely cancers. Within the first second of the bombs detonating, extreme infrared energy was released and instantly burned exposed skin for miles. The soft internal organs of all life were evaporated. Neutrons and gamma rays start to hit the ground within the first millisecond of the blast, the ionizing radiation that will claim the many lives in the days to come. The blast waves spread outwards at speeds reaching 7,000 miles per hour driving a fireball that would consume much of the city's buildings. At the centre of the explosion, temperatures would reach 7,000 Fahrenheit. Broken glass and all manner of debris was sent flying, cutting through those unfortunate enough to be caught up in the deadly tempest. The telltale gigantic mushroom cloud forms, visible for miles. With such a destructive force, it is no wonder that between the two bombs, some 200,000 people died. It was initially claimed that such bombs would be the best way to ensure an unconditional surrender of Imperial Japan. However, reviews of then-President Truman's documents would indicate that other reasons were at play. Chief amongst them was to justify the immense cost of the Manhattan Project. Around $2 billion was spent on the project to produce four bombs, which when accounting for today's money would be around $20 billion. One other consideration was that the deployment of the atomic bombs would act as a deterrent not only for the current enemy of the US, but also for all future enemies. As we will cover, the use of such weapons only led to their proliferation and the desire for more states to develop their own weapons, playing a major part in the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. Even during the Second World War, it was clear that the United States' key rival and future adversary would be the Soviet Union. In fact, the Soviet Union had already begun its own nuclear weapons program in 1943. As publications from European and American scientists on the matter dwindled, it was correctly assumed that other states were looking into producing such weapons. But due to the pressures of the war on the Eastern Front, work was slow and largely deemed as secondary. It was not until the Soviet Union leader Joseph Stalin was told of the existence of the American weapons by President Truman did the focus shift. It would be in December of 1946 that the Soviet scientists created their first chain reaction, with their first production reactor created in 1948. Soviet spies Klaus Futsch and Theodore Hall, who worked on the Manhattan Project, were able to provide the Soviets with information to help them speed up the process. On the 29th of August 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tested a Fat Man influenced bomb, with a blast yield of around 20 kilotons. The Soviet Union would not remain the only other country with such devastating weapons. The United Kingdom played a role in the Manhattan Project, with British research used. As of the 1943 Quebec Conference, closer ties with the US as to nuclear research were formally established. After the war, however, British and American relations as to assisting the British in building their own nuclear weapons did not materialise. It would not be until 1952 that the British successfully tested their first nuclear weapons an implosion-type device with a blast yield of 25 kilotons. The test was carried out on the Montebello Islands of Australia, a trend that would continue throughout the development of nuclear weapons. Remote locations such as the New Mexico desert were selected to be the testing site for nuclear weapons, and for good reason. But one alarming trend would see the Marshall Islands used as a testing site for dozens of American nuclear bombs. 
The US was granted a unique form of trusteeship over some 2,000 islands, home to thousands of people. During the 1950s, ever more destructive nuclear bombs were tested, such as the Ivy King, which was the first hydrogen bomb with a blast yield of 500 kilotons. Over $700 million has been paid out in compensation, with some of the islands still uninhabitable due to radiation. Nevertheless, the testing and development of nuclear weapons progressed, with the hydrogen bomb or the thermonuclear bomb being the preferred design. The idea behind the thermonuclear bomb is that it uses different elements to create a chain reaction. First, there will usually be a fission reaction followed by a fusion reaction. The fusion reaction will then trigger another fission reaction with a greater yield. In March of 1954, Operation Castle conducted tests of a number of thermonuclear devices, one of them called Shrimp. It detonated a blast yield of 15 megatons, the equivalent to 17 million tons of TNT. However, the largest nuclear bomb ever detonated was the Tsar bomb, a device created by the Soviet Union and tested in October of 1961. Its blast yield was a staggering 58 megatons. The delivery method for Little Boy and Fat Man were via bomber planes, and whilst this remained a key part of the nuclear program, new delivery methods were sought out. The development of missiles to deliver a nuclear bomb saw first breakthroughs in 1953, with surface-to-surface -surface missiles. The threat range would be no more than 20 to 25 kilometers, meaning they would be useful only in short-range engagements. But the Soviets and the United States had obtained Nazi scientists who had worked on the V-2 rocket program, weapons that when fired from mainland Europe could reach British cities. This enabled both to press ahead with the development of their own rockets, both for use in the space race and for carrying nuclear weapons. The first successful test of an intercontinental ballistic missile took place in August of 1957. The missiles, named R-7, flew over 6,000 kilometers, just a few thousand miles short of reaching Moscow from Washington, D.C. But it proved that the use of missiles were a great threat to the parties of the Cold War. Perhaps the best example of the threat posed can be seen in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, when Soviet missiles were discovered deployed in Cuba. Missiles so close to the United States were deemed a major threat. Nuclear war between two superpowers seemed imminent. Thankfully, the crisis was resolved when American missiles in Italy and Turkey were removed, and when Cuba removed the Soviet missiles with assurances from the United States that there would be no further invasion attempts of Cuba. The world saw how close the two nuclear powers came to potentially firing missiles at one another. This, however, did not stop the stockpiling of an overwhelming number of nuclear weapons. By 1965, the United States held over 30,000 nuclear weapons, the Soviet Union with some 6,000. At this point, both France and China had obtained nuclear weapons, with Israel's nuclear weapons remaining secret until 1986, though they were likely developed in the 70s. India, Pakistan, South Africa and North Korea would be the next countries to develop their own nuclear weapons, bringing the total to nine nuclear-capable nations, with a further five nations being bases for American nuclear weapons, these being Germany, Turkey, Belgium, Italy and the Netherlands. As weapons increased, it became ever clearer that the threat of mutually assured destruction was all that would keep the countries from being the first to initiate a nuclear attack. Some, seeing the deadly potential, began to push to put an end to nuclear weapons. Oppenheimer, the man who once led the Manhattan Project, was chief amongst them. His now infamous interview, expressing his regret for his role in creating the bomb. One of the first incidents that led to the movement against nuclear weapons was following the Operation Castle tests. Japanese fishermen were exposed to the fallout, with one dying only months after from radiation poisoning. Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell wrote an open letter to the nations of the world, warning of the dangers of such weapons and warning of their use. In November of 1957, the campaign for nuclear disarmament was formed in the United Kingdom, opposed to the proliferation of such weapons. 
Its logo has since become one of the more recognisable of the 20th century, a shorthand for peace. Aside from the countless protests carried out by ordinary people, the nuclear states put in place restrictions on the testing and use of nuclear weapons. In 1963, a partial ban on the testing of nuclear weapons above ground was signed between the US and the Soviet Union. And in 1968, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed. Although not all countries took heed, notably India, Pakistan and Israel were never signatories. During Reagan's presidency, steps were taken to reduce the number of nuclear weapons, eventually leading to a limit of 6,000 nuclear missiles on the signatory countries. South America and Africa declared themselves as nuclear weapon-free by the 1990s. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, countries that formed found themselves with Soviet nuclear weapons within their territory. Kazakhstan, Ukraine and Belarus all relinquished their nuclear stockpiles to Russia to be disposed of. A large number of nuclear weapons have since been decommissioned. At its peak, the Soviet Union had 39,000 and today Russia has just 6,000. It is thought that there are currently 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world today, down from the peak of around 60,000 in the 1980s. And now for something truly terrifying. A number of nuclear weapons have been misplaced, lost or otherwise unaccounted for. A mid-air collision between American bombers led to some being lost at sea and they are still unrecovered. There are known Soviet nuclear submarines that have sunk with their deadly cargo lost with them. It is also reported that some 84 portable Soviet nuclear weapons are unaccounted for. There are still plenty of nuclear weapons capable to destroy life as we know it, many times over. Nuclear weapons are still sought by some states as a way to bargain from weaker positions, to protect themselves from perceived threats from neighbours, or as a matter of national pride. Thousands are still held by China, Russia and the United States. And whilst the number of such weapons is on a downward trend, the genie has very much been let out of the bottle. We as a species are capable of wiping ourselves out multiple times over, and it's a technology that we will likely need to come to terms with, or face extinction.